work with us on the Okay, thank you very much, Miguel. Thank you, Alec. <clears throat> Thank you, everybody. It is a pleasure to, for me to be here at Barcelona Supercomputing Center. This is like second home in the sense that I was on the other side of the diagonal for a long time. And I started to come here when this was not even this. <laughs> it was very, very small, small enterprise, but now it's, it's amazing. Okay, this is the, the history of, of, of our work on the COVID pandemic. And uh, it's a history that has many corners, more of them uh, related to science, but a uh, huge part related to what the people do, human behavior, political behavior, etc. I can answer questions if you, if you have any about the concept. Let, let me introduce why physics. I mean, epidemiology seems to be a problem uh, related to medicine, right? or biology or something related, but why physics? Well, I think that the same problem can be mapped to the traffic problems. Imagine that your car is broken. You go to the mechanic, okay? And he's able to repair. He knows the, the bake, right? But if the problem is a collapse, in the center of Barcelona, the problem is not solved by any mechanic, okay? The problem is a global problem that has many uh, different phases related to synchronization of cars, to the timing, to the roads, etc. okay? In epidemiology, it happens more or less the same. I, I used to start with this citation not, it's not working. With this citation by by one of the Bernoulli brothers, you know, that in this in this particular paper that is called an attempt to a new analysis of the of the mortality cause by small poll and on the advantage of inoculation to prevent it, that could be perfectly a title of the vaccination problem we experienced one year ago. Okay. And he says something which is very, very interesting. He says at the end of the paper, it's simple with that in a matter which so closely concerns the well-being of the human race, no decision shall be made without all the knowledge which, uh, which a little analysis and calculation can prove. So it's simply this. It's look at the data, make some numbers, and take decision based on scientific knowledge. Right? Well, the first attempt to study epidemiology from a physics point of view, I will say that it started 150 years ago with the model by McKendrick and Kermack that essentially introduced what is called the law of mass action in epidemic modeling that is expressed by these two equations that remember us to a simple chemical reaction, right? You have two components. One of them is a susceptible individual. One is an infected individual. And with the probability beta, you came out with two infected individuals, the previous and the one that was healthy and balanced. Okay. And then any infected individual with a probability mu will cure and be susceptible again. This is a possible model. Or die. Depends on the model we can have different, what is called, compartments. I will explain. Okay, then let, let's fix the scope as everybody in epidemiology starts with, okay? In epidemiology, you have at least two fields of study, non-infectious diseases developed during the individual lifespan, like, for example, arthritis, and the epidemiology there study the risk factors associated to this, to this chance of developing diseases. And then there are infectious diseases that can be traced by, uh, between individuals, humans, animals, plants, etc. And epidemiology, the main risk factor is the presence of infection cases in the local population. Okay. Why I make this distinction? Because I think it's important. And the second one is because most of the countries in the what we call Occident were not prepared in this aspect. They were very good prepared in this. 
okay? Because essentially we have not experienced so many infectious diseases in European and North American countries, right? The people that was studying here usually study data from countries where these epidemics are common, especially in the regions of Africa and Asia. And this is this is something important to understand why the the, the public opinion went to the way they went when the pandemic started. Okay, we will concentrate on infectious diseases, of course. And then, in, and then in infectious disease, we have microparasites or, or, or macroparasites. This is important. I mean, these are small single cell viruses, bacteria, etc., and the other are bigger. Why this is important? Because if we are going to model, the difference when modeling is that the infections of these microparasites generally develop rapidly in a small number of initial parasites. That means that the internal dynamics of the pathogen, you hit the host, will be enough. Okay. And this is important for me. I mean, it's like, okay, the virus is so quick in reproducing that I don't take into account this, the life cycle of the virus. Okay? And the other case, this is not, in the other case, this is not possible. Okay? Then microparasites, infectious disease, and now we have to take a look at the transmission. It can be a direct transmission, which is transmitted between two subjects, that one of them is exposed to the, to the infection of another individual or indirect transmission. This is also very important because the transmission is carried by a third place, for example, a vector. Okay? This is the mosquitoes and this is all the modeling of the malaria or infections in water or other third agents that is participating in. Okay? We'll concentrate on direct transmission and let's see what is going on. The, First example is very simple, okay? We are worried about what we call the basic reproduction number R that you have here on TV many, many, many times. What it is? Essentially is the expected number of cases that are directly generated by one case in a population where all of the individuals are susceptible to infection. That's the definition, yeah? And it's important to take this definition in mind to the posterior part of the trend, yeah? Let's see, if this factor is three, it's a branching process from the first individual, I will produce three new individuals. From this three, I will produce three more and three more and three more. In two steps, I have nine individuals in place. okay? Good. This is the cases of influenza, Ebola, and COVID with R 1.4, 2.0, or 3.0, that was the expected error at the initial stage of COVID. I can advance that the initial error here in Spain on the first wave was larger than seven, okay? Why I put these numbers? Because if I count the number of total cases that I have in nine days, I can plot this in a prevalence, number of total cases by the day, and this will be influenza, this will be Ebola, and the problem is that I need to escape to put this in this That was it. That was it. That was it. There is no health system no health able system. to cope with the uh, growing of COVID for a disease with an air larger than three. This will collapse everything because you will have all these symptoms cases at the same time, okay? And that's that's the, the only thing that you have to take into account, that you you are absolutely fucked up with this. Okay, <laughs> let's see what can we do from a physical point of view to understand what is going on on this reproduction number, okay? A very simple calculation that takes into account that the individuals are in an homogeneous mixing state. That means essentially that everybody can contact with everybody, etc. This parameter L depends only on four factors, which are T, the time window duration of the infectious period. Okay, during a time you are infected, that this is the most dangerous one because you, you, will, you will be spreading the infection. Beta, which is the infection probability per contact. K is the average number of contacts per unit time. 
how many people I will be able to transmit per unit time. And ROES, oops, ROES, which is the fraction of susceptible individuals in this population. Okay. Then the problem was solved from the very beginning. We know what we have to do. I mean, this parameter, if it is larger than one, we have an exponential growth. If it is one, we have a constant disease. If it is lower than one, this will die out. And what can we do to act on these four parameters? There is no other way. There is no other way, okay? And what can you do with this parameter? Okay, because this is a product, I want to reduce the factors of this product, right? Then I can reduce tau. How can I reduce the time window duration of the fixtures period? By detecting the people very early and isolating these individuals in such a way that during the time period of the infection, they will not be in contact with us. Okay? Second, reduce beta. Or you have drugs, or you have a physical protection for this infection. Okay? Reduce K, reduce the number of contacts, which is social distancing and confinement, essentially. Or reduce ROAS. Reducing ROAS can only be achieved by vaccination, or confinement for long periods, or the infection immunity. I mean, leave everybody to infect themselves, and that's it. You reduce the number of susceptibles in the, in the pool. Okay. At the very beginning of the epidemics, we don't have drugs, we don't have vaccinations. Take a look. This is what we did. This is what we did. We did the isolation periods. We did the physical protection with the face masks, and we did the social distance and confinement to reduce the parameter F. Everything was here. Easy, right? But it's not so easy if you want to go to the details. Good. Let me go back to the basis in, in epidemic screening. You have several ways to describe an infection. One is the medical status. You are incubating the disease and then you have disease. And that's it. But in epidemiology, you use this kind of compartments in which you identify a state which is susceptible, you are a bit exposed to the virus. There is a state in which you are exposed to the virus. There is an infectious period, and there is a recovery time. And this is how the pathogen enters your body, and how your immune response, usually with some delay, acts on the same on the same infection. Okay, good. This is the expansion that I did already, and let's see what it represents. This represents a compartmental model that is called by the first initial of one of these compartments, S, L, I, okay? Good. This particular one is, depending on the disease that you have, you will consider one or another epidemiological model. The compartments are defined by the specificities of the epidemics that you have in hand or the disease epidemic, okay? For example, this first one is for chickenpox, measles, rubella, etc. The SIR is the simplification of this particular one for mathematical purposes. There are some infections that are of the type SI. You get infected for the rest of your life. This is many, many times in plants. The SIS, which is the paradigmatic uh, associated to influence, but in, in general, it's not so true, because essentially you are susceptible, you are infected, you recover, and you are susceptible again. But you are susceptible to another virus. Okay? But essentially, our, our problem was that we think that COVID was an SIR, I mean, you recover and you are susceptible again to the virus. And we say this from the very beginning, and, and we have experienced this in the last two years. Essentially, are there infections that you see that people around you are getting with COVID? Okay, good. Then let me explain the SIS uh, and what was our idea, because this is not something that was made by us. I mean, these differential equations in continuous time to predict the evolution of an SIR system can be found in any book. It's, it's common knowledge nowadays, right? But what we say is that what happens if instead of discrete states for the individuals, which is you are S or you are I, 
you associate a probability of being in a certain state. That means that essentially, if I am an agent in this, in this system, I'm not susceptible or infected, I have a probability of being in one of these states. This introduction of the probability is especially rich to confront a stochastic process that will happen when we spread the disease. Then instead of having a set of differential equations, we will have a set of deterministic maps for the evolution of these probabilities, which is very simple. I, I will explain mathematically what it is. It accounts for the specific contact matrix. This is a very good point because in the continuous models, the network of contacts is not used. And this is important okay, between individuals instead of an ensemble. And it's easy to model from the Markov chain of the possible states in discrete time steps. Okay? And we can define a macro state and compute everything that you can compute in a, in a continuous system. This is not a problem. We average the quantities for the fraction of infected individuals, and we will obtain exactly the same result that we, we can do in this, in this case. And this was our first proposal. And let me explain how it works. Okay, let's let's assume that this is time t and you have an state. This is infected, okay? With a probability that we call mu, uh, you recover, you will become susceptible. To the contrary, one minus mu, you remain infected, okay? If you are susceptible, let me introduce this little bit of qi, which is if you are susceptible with a probability of qi, I will remain susceptible. And with a probability one minus two i, I will be infected. I will explain this. Then look, it's very easy. This is time t, this is time t plus one. Okay. Then what is the probability of uh, agent i to be infected in time t plus one? Is the probability that this individual was infected in time t and do not return? Okay plus the probability that this guy was susceptible and it get infected. That means that to construct this equation, you go to the probability of being infected at time t plus one, which is this and this one, okay? And I go back and I make the problems. Very simple. This is very useful because if I make a more complicated compartmental model, I have a way to compute this exactly very easily. Okay. Again, the probability of being susceptible is exactly the same. And let's look at the QI. What is QI? Look, it's one minus beta. Beta is the probability of infection contact. Like contact Q, what is the probability that you will send the virus? Multiplied by Rji, which is the probability that I have a connection with you. Yeah, if I don't have a connection, I will not infect you. Multiplied by the probability that you were infected. That means that this is a probability that any of you, J, infects me. Uh, one minus this is the probability that you don't infect. The product for all my neighbors is the probability that nobody of you will infect. Okay, what is the contrary of one of QI? One minus QI is the probability that any of you will infect me. Okay, one minus the probability that nobody infects me. It's basic probability, but it's key to have this, this understanding. Okay, once this is in order, then we can simply get right off the index i and s because they are coupled and, and they sum in the total population or one if this is normalized this is a very simple equation which is a dynamical system of n math equations with n time dependent values okay the parameters are the initial conditions of t0 the contact matrix the inspection rate and the recovery rate. and with all these the system we suspect that was a contraction mapping for every value of the parameters, and that you can find a solution in interval zero one. It took three years for us. We published just one month ago the mathematical proof of this theorem. That essentially means that we have a critical point in interval zero one for this infection model. Okay, good. We try this computing the fraction of infected individuals as a function of the 
infection rate comparing in a network with an SAS model with a recovery rate of one in a three three network with 10 to the four nodes. And we plot here the results of the theoretical line that we call MMCA, micro, uh, microscopic macro chain approach. And the result of an agent model of Monte Carlo where we simulate particles uh, running and, and interacting with each other. And the uh, individual probabilities are very well determined on the full of, of the susceptible of the uh, fraction of infected individuals was, was very good. And we did this years ago when there was this Aviar uh, influence problem, uh, starting the uh, infection in Oaxaca, Mexico. And we did the agent based model Monte Carlo, and we did the computation with the microscopic macro chain with approach of the probabilities. And essentially, we were able to compute exactly at which points of the planet this, uh, this infection will be found and at what level uh, using only the communication by air transportation around the globe. Okay. And this was like, okay, we have here only a 2% error between the prediction and the Asian based model. And uh, it was like, oh, the model is, is very good, but you know, you have always to confirm with it. Before going to the data, things that you can do with these equations is to compute the critical, the epidemic threshold. The epidemic threshold is the value of the infectivity from which on you expect this disease not to die out, but to stay on the population for, for time. And this is very easy to compute because you go to the still state in which you, you remove the dependence on time and you try to solve this. Near the critical point, what you know is that the probability of infection should be very close to zero, right? Because you have a transition. It's like a phase transition in second order physics. Then if this is true, I can approximate this probability with was a product, you remember, by something that is additive at first order. We substitute this and you always find an eigenvalue problem that determines the critical value of the infectivity as the uh, largest eigenvalue of this matrix uh, of the eigenvalue. Okay. But this is a typical result. This is exactly what you will find in a continuous model of epidemic speed. Okay. So in this eigenvalue problem, the epidemic threshold is found and it's always dependent on the maximum eigenvalue of the matrix term, which is the one that contains all the information about your uh, disease. Here is the contact matrix, the probability of uh, curing the cell from, uh, from infected to susceptible, and the infection probability from susceptible to. Okay. Good. With these results, we started to think what happens in metapopulation, in which what you have really is populations that travel from point to point, carry on infection, and how this model can be extrapolated to this model that is called a metapopulation model. Because now I'm not so interested in a single individual, but I am interested in what happens in this population. Okay. But what happens in this population depends on this, this, and this, because they are connected. And the people who struggle, which is equivalent to say that the virus will be go on, on far uh, to one point to another. Okay, then the idea is similar. Instead of uh, working with the individual probability of being infected or not, I can cross grain my system and say, now the interesting uh, variable is the fraction rho i of infected individuals in a certain patch, which is the patch R. And in this particular model, I will use the metapopulation with recurrent mobility. Okay, I will not insist so much on this, but if you go to the literature, one of the problems that you find in, in epidemic spreading is that they always thought about a diffusive model, which is if I am infected in this region and I spread the virus, the virus will spread more and more in the network as a diffusion process. But those are diffusive particles. And humans, we are not diffusive particles. We are regular. I mean, we go to places for sure, 
and we come back home. Always. There is a place where you come back, okay? And this is very important to understand the epidemic spirit because you will carry this virus to another place and go back with the virus to home. And this is very different of any diffusive model, which is the first order of this propagation. Okay? And this makes a difference. I will prove it. Okay, we can go with the same model, adapting to the meta populations, the descriptions that I put uh, in, the, in the last part of the, of the The probability of a healthy individual associated to an O. Now it's important where I am associated. I am a person living in Barcelona or in Madrid or in Tarragona. This is I, okay? Is infected at time t. We have this probability as a function of the mobility. The probability of being infected now depends on this t, which is the probability that I move from here to there, okay? From one place to the other. Plus, in the case that I move, the contact that I have with other meta populations. Then, with probability one minus p, I don't move, and the only determination of my infection comes from my node, from my place. And the other is I move and the infection can come from other places. Okay. Good. Uh, what is the probability that an individual that is an old I being infected by an individual from node J and time T? Well, is this expression, which is similar to the previous one. One minus beta rho J T is the probability that somebody from J will infect me. One minus this is the probability that I will not be infected. But it depends on the number of people that will travel from I to J, which is this exponent, N, J plus, okay? Then we can express this mathematically according to the number of travels that you will observe in the model, which is the data that we use from, from the middle. Okay? This is one minus P, I don't move, and it only depends on the demographics of my node, the number of people that is in my place. And this is P weighted by the number of travels of people that come from other regions in J. Well, with all this stuff, you have these equations that you can solve again and take a comparison with the Monte Carlo model and the theory and everything was going on very well in the simulations. We can compute also the stationary states similarly to what I did from the one single case. The maths are a little bit more complicated, but essentially we linearize and we have a matrix that we have to analyze in order to understand what is going on. And this matrix is determined here after the eigenvalue problem by this factor, which is a little bit cumbersome, but it's very easy to understand. Look. There are populations, I have nodes in I, in J, and there are other populations. And I have the flows. I am assuming that I am able to capture data about the flows, the flows from I to J. Then this matrix is telling, in the first term, if I am infected in my location, I can infect another individual in my location, of course. If I am infected in my location and I travel to J, I can be infected there, or the symmetric way, uh, Somebody is infected there, come to my place and infect me. This is the, the other. Okay. But those are second order terms. And then there is another possibility that we move to a new place altogether and I get infected. This is this case. This nonlinearity, which is not extraordinarily complex to understand, allows us to compute what will happen in different situations. When you have typical graphs like erdos rheny graphs, which are homogeneous networks or spin-free, and I compute what is the critical beta for a value of the mobility t compared to the critical beta at t equals zero, of course, if I plot here t, here this quotient, it has to start at one. As we move with a larger probability, this decays. Okay? which is trivial, it's saying that beta is lower than beta critical at k equal to zero. And this is the common sense, which is, what is better for the epidemics for me? I move or not? And you will say, stay, don't move. Because if you move, the critical uh, point will go up to zero, right? I mean, 
this is the future and it's not surprising at all. But when we try with real data, things change because this depends a lot on the number. The first data we had were from Santiago de Cali in Colombia. We have a collaborator there and it was very easy to us to access the data about mobility, something that here in Spain was very, very hard five years ago, at least for scientists. You have a lot of money, you pay a lot of money. Not in a public way. We did this in, in Colombia for 22 districts that are composed in by 2.2 million people. And we have 10 to the five trajectories in the city. These trajectories can be thought as a network. And we put here the model and we try to see what happens if we start an epidemic in one of the places. This is the evolution of the Monte Carlo in time, uh, sorry, the, the model and the Monte Carlo in time, they were very equivalent, but then the surprise. It turns out that for certain values of the mobility, the epidemics, instead of going down in the previous plot of beta or the beta critical, you go up, okay? And this is super counterintuitive. It seems that there is a optimal P for which, the movement favors the elimination of it. Okay. We didn't understand. Oops, sorry. We didn't understand this, and, and the editor in Nature say that it was very complicated and we need a model to explain with hands what is going on. What we did is to pick an analysis asymptotic for P uh, going to zero. And in this case, you can prove analytically that the largest eigenvalue of the matrix that you will uh, end up with is depending on the, on the mobility P up to a square. Once you have this square, it is for sure that they will be a extreme, a local extreme of this function. And then we identify that there are three regimes in the region in which you can compute the probability, which is one over the number, at least you have one individual infected. We cannot go here because it means 0.2 of five individual infected. So okay. one of n max and we use the probability one. And you can have that the minimum of this parabolic function goes in the forbidden physical region. What you will observe is always an increase on the on the lambda max. Remember that the previous plot was on the inverse of, of uh, lambda max. Okay. Okay. Then, observe, you can have the minimum within the interval of plausibility, or you can have the minimum outside. And those are three regions in which the, the, the dynamics of the epidemics will be very different. Well, we analyze this for, for uh, the case of P equals zero, and it will depend only on the population of each individual node, which is trivial, which is the one that will dominate the epidemic spreading. The largest node, because there is no movement, and it only depends on the number of people in this, in this place. I mean, if we cut all the communications in the space between cities, the critical threshold will be defined by the population that has the largest number of individuals. That's it. probably Barcelona. Okay. Uh, in these three different regimes, we try to explain this with uh, an embedded uh, number of cities that are connected in this structure that is called the star-like city, because it's a star in which people move with a probability to the center and with another probability to the neighborhood, etc. This is a very specific toy model that we plan because here you can reduce the matrix to a four by four matrix that you can solve exactly uh, with an eigenvalue problem. But this is only to prove that essentially we will have as a function of these movements, a region of uh, detriment of the epidemics and a region of uh, enhancement of the epidemics. This is a paper that was published in 2018, and we use this in, in different metapopulations in, in Colombia, from Santiago de Cali, Medellin, and Bogota, and we identify that this is type two, this is type three, and this is type three. In this 
cities type C, the mobility is helping to detriment the this, this, the, the surprising result that you have as a function of the map. Essentially, the home take measures the message up to now is that mobility can cause an enhancement of a, or a detriment of the epidemics. And it only depends on the flows that you have in the particular city. Okay. This was previous no, knowledge to COVID. Then it came to COVID to Spain. The history is a little bit more complicated. I mean, we did the paper in 2018 and we were very, experience with the mobility problems and the epidemic split, okay? In 2020, we were in a conference in Japan. It was at the very beginning of January, the second week of January. And we never, at least I never heard about the COVID problem yet, but it was happening in Wuhan already, okay? And the people in Japan were super scared and they were using the mask and all the TV news were saying that you have to be aware, et cetera. We were flying back to Spain on 21 of January. And uh, what I show in the airport of Hong Kong that was over, over scale before going to Barcelona uh, was pretty terrible because you see the military people, on the airport, everybody masked and sort of problem was going on there, right? When I arrived, the first thing I did is buy masks. I remember in the pharmacy that the, the girl there say, are you going to China? No, no, no. The problem with China is coming here. <laughs> they thought that I was crazy at this moment. Probably it was crazy at this moment. Well, the thing is that we meet all together and we say, okay, here we have a problem. It is very likely that we will obtain data from China very soon about beta, okay? The infectivity per contact. And if this is so, we can go here to Spain, we can re rebuild our model around the problem of COVID and see what is going on, okay? Well, the story is much more complex, but after thinking for a lot of while, uh, we identified that here, the compartmental model has to take into account a very important thing. Here I have a susceptible, exposed, infected recovery, okay? But there is a compartment here, which is the symptomatic. I remember to fight with all the medical staff here in Spain, all of them, because they were saying that there is no such a thing as an asymptotic state. But within, without this asymptomatic state, it was impossible to understand the value of the basic reproduction number that was providing from China, okay? And you can say, okay, it's China. The data from China go with a little bit of math. Okay? But it happens that we found this uh, diamond Princess data, you remember a boat that was to stop Japan that was serving as a laboratory because they didn't uh, leave people from the boat during the full infectious period. And we have very good data from that, that was published in Lancet. Then we identify, okay, there is people that there is a symptom. They have an infection, but they don't have any symptom and they were going spring the virus. And this is, this is super important. Another important thing is that in here from susceptible to expose, you see that here we have a matrix. And this is another very important thing. From the very beginning, the news that were arrived with the scientific literature, they say about the acute cases were related to all people, remember? And this means that you have to stratify by ages. Otherwise, this model will work for anything. And then the most important part. After the infection, what they have here is a lot of compartments that are called pre-hospitalized disease, hospitalized in ICU, diseases, hospitalized in ICU, recover, et cetera. This is not common in an epidemiological model. This is the clinical part. 
But remember the beginning of my talk. I say that this is a problem of traffic. This is a problem of synchronization of cases. This is an exponential growth that overcome any capacity that you have in the health system. Then it was super important to have this clinical impact because the limitation for the epidemics from the governments is not the number of people that die. It's not to collapse the health system. This is the red line that you cannot cross. You cannot collapse the health system because if you collapse the health system, the problem is not gone. The problem is that we are in the wild. You fall, you fall from your motorbike and there is no way to give assistance to you. Okay? You have a cancer, there is no way to give assistance to you. You have anything different from COVID, there is no assistance. Then the public system falls down, okay? This is the red line. Then the problem was, we have not to estimate the number of infected, we have to estimate the number of infected that we need this hospital system. Okay? The intensive care units. And the intensive care units in any country are not a scale to the number of people uh, that come, uh, that become infected by a pandemic. It's a scale for the number of people that are critical conditions, and this is a very short number, okay? If you synchronize like here with a very small fatality ratio, you will kill a lot of people. And the infection fatality ratio, the very beginning, remember people saying it's equivalent uh, uh, to this one of the flu. And it was true. The number were equivalent. But the number of people that has is not. You have to multiply this factor by the number of people. And the number of synchronized people that you have seen in the former exponential growth was impossible. Was impossible. Okay, then. We impose this model with the epidemiological and the clinical dynamics. We stratify first on three stages, kids, adults, and senior people. We got data from the contact matrix of these ages. But this was a very good thing because there was a paper in plus computation in biology that had for more than 110 countries, the contact matrix between different age study. And this was absolutely basic to understand what, what would be the evolution of them. We got mobility data at the very beginning from the Instituto Nacional de Estadística. This was another of the stories uh, that made a little bit clear. I mean, I, I tried to get the mobility data and I was calling people. Nobody has it. Nobody. But the INE has it. Okay? The Institute Nacional de Estadística has it. The Institute Nacional de Estadística, I call them, no, I cannot offer it. But you have to take that. You did one of the most biggest experiments on getting prices of mobility, but they were doing by phone calls, records, right? And there was a law that says that you cannot do this without the people consent. And it's been a lot of politics there. But the thing is that they give us the mobility data of 2011. And I say, come on, 2020. And the guy says, Alex, I promise, because I have seen the data, that there is no difference in the mobility that we were observing in 2019 compared to 2011. And this was for granted. I mean, at the end, the MIDMA already started with the data, but at the very beginning, it was like this. Then, in the, in the model, we also have something that is called K0, which is the fraction of population that is confined in the house. I mean, people that will remain at home because they can. Telework or retired people, etc. But there is a fraction of people that will not go out. The confinement population uh, keep in contact with other confinement households with probability P. And uh, there is also a social distancing, okay? We put all these kind of parameters that can reduce the contact between people. 
saying, imagine that you have a fraction of the population which is not contacting with the other, what will be the other, okay? And we did the full analysis. This is the Markov model for this expression is here. It's a little bit cumbersome, but it's exactly identical to what I explained at the very beginning with the SLS. Longer, but not more difficult, okay? There is something which is important, which is this transfer function how these movements of the people will scale with the demography and with the infection that you have. Because there is a sort of awareness that we know that is part of the human behavior, which is you don't care so much until one of your friends or relatives or close people get in. In this case, you start to, to break the awareness up and say, hey, 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 this is very good. Because at the very beginning, it's like China. No? Everything is happening in China. Okay. China. No, everything is, um, something is happening in Barcelona or Tarragona. Oops, uh, this is close. Okay? In the same effect. And th this is important because this scaling factor plays uh, an important role in the full model. But this is a technical detail. Let me say what we did. At the very beginning, I told with the Instituto Carlos III de Salud, I called everybody. No response. No response. Okay, no response. Let's do what the science can do, which is make public what we have. And we publish this map, which is this map of every municipality in Spain, in which we compute through the model what will be the risk or the number of infections that you have around you. Okay. To make this map was the most thorough of force I never had before. I mean, we had no single data of cases. It was every day coming to the office, six in the morning, with the team. Every single uh, newspaper of La Rioja or whatever to pick the cases and try to identify where these cases come from. And in some days, uh, it's, a, it's a guy that uh, was living in the uh, you know, Toledo, whatever, and it was described in another place. I mean, crazy, crazy, totally crazy, okay? To inject the time zero conditions of the model, because you need to know what is the initial infection, right? And you, we were case by case counting. In three days, it was more than 200 uh, news related to somebody infected there, there, there. Okay, we did the model. And the most important thing, at some point we say, this is the problem. Because nobody was mm, having fear of the infection. But when we show this, everybody, newspapers, TVs, they come back and say, hey, 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 here there is a problem. Because you are saying that here, the occupation of the hospital intensive care unit will be 462. Here, in 60, 63. In three days, we predicted what would happen, what will happen if this was the situation. The government knew the situation. And at this point, everybody was saying, okay, let's talk, okay? And then, I cannot imagine the, 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 the vertiginous of my life at these moments because everybody, understood that there was a very big problem here. But look, there are crazy things. Somebody from the Comunidad de Valencia called me at home. Alex, I am the Conseller de Salud de Valencia. Tenemos un problema con el COVID y sabemos que esto fue un Okay, I see. Yes, uh, and the problem is this, that, 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 and they say, but you think that we will overcome the intensive care unit's capabilities? I say, sure. So, come on. We have uh, 4,000 beds of intensive care units. Okay, 4,000. They say, if you have 4,000, we have no problem in Spain. Okay? You have 300. And they didn't know. 
they didn't know. And this, this value was picked from the literature that was a review in hospital, um, whatever, in the Teca Sanitaria of 10 years ago. I mean, it, it was, the information was like this. Nobody knew anything. I cannot imagine in Madrid. I'm not kidding. I'm not kidding. Ministerio de Sanidad, what the hell they are doing? Nothing. Why? Because health is distributed for many communities. This is one of the places in the government in which you are expected to sit there, wait, and nothing happens. But it comes a pandemic. Crisis at the highest level. Nobody was able to structure the data sharing, the, the, the problem. The, there was no control. I mean, every community has its own casuistic to bring whatever masks, the, the process of asking for the mask, bringing the mask, etc. Who is the, the merchant that you are dealing with? Crazy. In Madrid, was an impact terrible at the level of the government. Then everything was like nobody expected, but nobody was there for this. Then when, when we offer this, mm, things have started to become problematic. This is from 24 February to 27 of March, okay? The government of Spain, after asking us for several uh, reports, they put some kind of measures. Remember our first confinement that was uh, allowed to go work, et cetera, and there are only, remember that was when there were schools and, uh, but with this, without restriction of mobility, this is the maximum capability in the full Spain system. Okay. Without the extension that was, that was made by Madrid and Barcelona, remember that we, in two weeks, they say, okay, we have uh, increased the number of beds to 500. Uh, you go to Ikea and try to sleep at 500 beds. The problem is not this. The problem is that if you are in an intensive care unit, you need personnel of these units. We didn't have this. We didn't have. People were dying before entering the hospital. And this was the case. This is without the restrictions in mobility. This is what will happen four days after with the restrictions that we have. And the only way to go through this limit is to make the total confinement here, okay? And make the call to do this. Oh, it takes some time to convince people. But at the end, uh, we need the analysis of the reproduction number using the model for COVID. Now, it's the same expression that I presented at the very beginning, but here you have convolutions because you have delays on the time of the infection and the infected individuals, etc. But essentially, it's the same. This is tau beta at all effect, and this is the connectivity on the road. And then we associated this with the mobility for the different uh, ages: adult, young, elderly, and the average. And the idea was to go down or equal to one, which is what we. Before this, before March 14, there is a decay. And this is something we have studied in a retrospective paper that gives me a lot of head problems because why it was going down before the total confinement, this is something that we observed. And it was the awareness. I mean, people get a word few days before the confinement. I mean, people was saying what is going on. And people was trying to get back to the, fund, to the social fund. And this effect was not uh, seen before. And now that we have this respective data, we can observe how this awareness really make a difference, okay? Uh, what is the effect of the confinement? Because you say, okay, if you confine more people, you will obtain better results, how is the relation? And the thing is that the relation is now linear. 
is quadratic in the confinement and the social distance. That means that if you go to the analysis of the reproductive number uh, in terms of the confinement, what you observe is this. There are several regimes. This is the social distance. The social distancing essentially for us, it was related to the use of, of face masks because you didn't reduce your social contacts, but you reduce the probability of contact uh, of infection per contact if you were not. And this is the confinement in terms of the mobility. Of the and look, there is a flattening regime and there is a bending regime. Remember that everybody in, on TV is saying, we have to flatten the curve. Tenemos que aplanar la curva. Remember? You don't have to aplanar la curva. You have to bend the curve. You have to doblar la curva. Because otherwise, the flattening region is giving you the infection for a very long, 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 long. Okay? And this bending here for the social distancing that we empirical measure from, from the analysis of the cases and the use of mass, we are in this region. And that means that we can do different levels of confinement. And this is the effect. This is a flattening of the curve. Okay? But there is a region here where you see the bending. The bending of the curve is here. Okay? And in this case, this bending was starting at 0 0.6, which is exactly the number that we have previously to the confinement. Then the idea is that we have to force a little bit more the confinement, and we will do this with the curve. Okay? And this is what we did at the, at the final stage. OK, as any model which is working with data, you need a calibration process, you know, and a validation process. And this is the, the number of points that are real data. This is new daily deaths. This, this is new daily cases. This is the model of the data for the different communities. But the interesting thing is here. When we train with this data here, we can produce all the behavior of, of the curve, the real cases, with a pretty good accuracy. Okay. And this was one of the convincing parts because even the problem of the data was crazy. Imagine you, you have communities that report with weeks of difference. And I have a photo of uh, Zaragoza today. And the photo of Madrid is from six days ago. And the photo of Barcelona from 10 days ago. And this happened every single day. And this delay was variable. Then the underreporting, the, the shifting of cases, et cetera, was, was totally crazy. Still in these situations, we were able to, to, to predict what was the bending, how to act at the moment of, of, uh, of the pandemic, in which we started to, to collapse the, the uses and, and that's it. And we have evolved this model uh, because at the moment, this is the paper of 2020, the model is suitable for monitoring these epidemic outbreaks and gives a great information about the geographical spreading and the, the region at risk. And it's, a, it's useful to project a scenario and evaluating what will happen if, okay, that's the that's okay. The limitation is that inside the patches, we have an infield. That means that the more um, small the geographic area, the better, okay? And this is working at the level of municipalities was, was very useful, but if you go to the level of villages, even more, et cetera. Uh, there is indistinguishability of the individuals. This is what, uh, everybody in the world was, was working at the moment. Uh, you don't distinguish different individuals. And the individual is, is a particle. Okay? If you put this thing, this ability that we did, the mathematical problem is super complicated, but we have a equivalent result. Absolutely. And the international mobility was not included because at the moment, all the airport transportation was closed. Remember, you can move fast. But you can incorporate this with the airport transportation networks. And, what we have been done from 2020 up to now is to incorporate into the model the vaccines that we have, the warning of the immunity that we know that is happening, uh, the problem of second or third reinfection in the, in the severity of the disease, and put all of them 
all these into the context again of the health system. What is then good news? That so far there is no risk to the red line. Remember the red line? Number of occupation of the intensive care units. If you move this and say, no, 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 my red line is the number of deaths, then things change. And probably we will be still using some kind of protection. Okay. And this is more or less what is going on. Open questions. We don't know much about the evolution of the virus. I mean, so far the variant seems to be uh, with the same index fatality ratio that we had before, and we have gained a lot of immunity. Some of them natural, some of them from vaccination. This is a sort of protection from critical situations. But at the same time, we heard that the number of long COVID uh, disease is larger and larger. And nobody seems to know very well what is going on. Uh, and this is a problem, which is also contributing to the problem in the health system, because we have to take care of this. And the last meetings we have with the, with the COVID committee, et cetera, they are all intended on this line. We published recently a report on long COVID because it's the big problem now, and it's, it's affecting a lot of people. And that's it. I, I cannot say goodbye without presenting the people that really did the big work. My collaborator, Sergio Gomez, which is professor at the University of Brazil, Jesus, uh, professor at the University of Zaragoza, Clara is a distinguished researcher at the University, David Soriano, who was a student at Jesus at this moment, Benjamin Steinegger, that was my PhD student, and Juan Matamala, that was my PhD student. And these people were the people that did the work, really. <laughs> and those are some references we want to to check in the literature of this. And thank you very much.